Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I tell you what, I feel the Spirit of the Lord ready to break forth in this place today. Amen. Hallelujah. I tell you, anytime we exalt and glorify the Lord, He will come into our midst. The Bible said He inhabits the praise of His people. Amen. Give Him a good hand clap of praise and worship in this place. He's a great God today and He deserves all of our praise and our worship today. Amen. So good to be in the house of the Lord this morning and it's good to see each and every one of you today. It's good to have all of our visitors. It's good to have Tyler this morning with Amanda and Ava with us today. So glad to see them and he's got a birthday coming up so he's getting old. <laughs> but uh, so thrilled of what the Lord's done in his life and I believe what the Lord's going to continue to do in his life and uh, he'll be coming and uh, not to distant future and uh, be sharing with us the things that the Lord has done for him and where he's placed him. God's using him to minister to men uh, in the same situation that he had came through and they're baptizing men almost on a daily basis. The young man that went the other day, Zach, we, uh, he got baptized the other day. Um, uh, Emily got baptized this week. Amen. We just praise the Lord for what the Lord is doing today. Amen. Hallelujah, and I thank God. It's good to have John Corley Cooley with us this morning. Good to have him here today, amen. Hallelujah, just so thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning, amen. We appreciate each and every one of you. Good to see our normal, regular attendance here today. Each one of you is significant in the kingdom of God. And I believe the Lord smiles every time you walk into his house. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Such an honor to be here today. We appreciate the Lord. If you have your Bibles and you're able, will you stand with us? Turn to the book of Job. Now, don't be afraid of it. Say, if you're a millennial, it looks like Job, but it's really Job. You don't got to be afraid of it. Just a little funny there. It's all right. We live in a serious society, boys. You got to be careful. You joke and they get mad at you. <laughs> but the book of Job, that's about middle ways of your Bible, right before the book of Psalms. We'll read a little portion out of 32 and then 36. I'm going to make a whole lot of sense to you. I really didn't even want to read these scriptures, but um, with the thought that I want to think about this morning. Hey, the Lord's calling. Hold on. <laughs> He's got a word for us. Job chapter 32, and then we'll read a little portion out of 36. Job chapter 32, begin with verse number 1. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elijah, the son of Barakel, the Buzite of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. Then he begins to speak there. And then in verse chapter 36, beginning with verse number one, <coughs> Elihu also proceeded and said, Suffer me a little, and I will shew thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar and will ascribe righteousness to my Maker. For truly my words shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. Behold, God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and in wisdom and the church said amen. amen you can be seated this morning with the condition of our world and the the shape of our society that we are living in today not only have we seen uprisings on every hand and all kinds of political incorrectness, all kinds of things and uh, every form that is coming out of protest and riot that is all across our country today, but the biggest concern that I see today, Democrats will always be Democrats and Republicans will always be Republicans and the left will always be the left and the right will always be the right. I'm not as much concerned about those things as I am, whether it's left or right or white or black or Democrat. 
Democrat or Republican today, the problem that I see it is that we have turned our back upon Almighty God and it's almost that we have put God on trial today. God is on trial. He's on trial by his existence. I told you not too uh, many years ago that on a bus, a signage on the side of a bus in New York City, it said, God is dead. One place, somebody had a picture on Facebook not too long ago, some uh, young man wearing a shirt that said, if Jesus Christ came back, we'd kill him again. Amen. You don't have that, shouldn't surprise you. Uh, that shouldn't surprise you at all. The world ain't no better now than it was then. The sinner and the ungodly would still crucify Christ just like they did 2,000 years ago as well as half of the church. But his trial, his existence is on trial by some. His character and his justice, they're on trial as well. His truth is on trial. His word, is it absolute or is it relative in the time in which we live? In the book of Job, we find that the justice of God is on trial just like that it is today. Since 9-11, the terrorist attacks of today put God on trial again in the society that we're living in in 2020. How can God be just when, and in light of the suffering that is going on? How can we say that God is good with all the war and the terrorism and the poverty and starvation and dictatorship and persecution and racism? How can we continue to trust and worship God if God is good? Why does all these things continue to happen? Well, the good book open up, opens up with these few words. In the beginning, God Hallelujah. Not in the beginning, man. Not in the beginning, a Democrat. Not in the beginning, a Republican. Not in the beginning, the United States. But in the beginning, it was God. And I tell you, we got to go back to the beginning. we got to turn back to the basics today. we got to get back to God today. Why is it important? Because the knowledge of God is the foundation of our faith. You remember Jesus came to his disciples and he looked around and he said, Who do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Well, some say that you're a prophet. Some say that you're Jeremiah. Some think that you're Isaiah. But then Jesus turned to his own men and he said, But who do you say that I am? Hallelujah to God. Our knowledge of God is the basis of our, our faith. We trust God to the degree that we know Him and we actually understand Him in light of the Word of God. It makes no difference to me what you think about God. I take my basis of my knowledge about God from this Word. I don't take it from a man. I don't take it from an institution. I don't take it from a denomination. I don't take it from a white a man with white hair and a long white beard carrying a stick. I take my revelation of God from the word of the living God. If your God is not found in this word, then he's not a God today. I'm telling you, God is still holy. He's still righteous. And he's still a good God today. You see, Job hit a little bit of a low point in his life and he was trying to plead his cause and defeat his defend his innocency before God. And he felt like he couldn't find God. You ever been there? Job was there. He said, I reached for him on the left hand. I couldn't find him. I looked for him on the right hand and I couldn't find him. I looked in front of him and I looked behind me and seemingly I, I couldn't find him. There's been times in my life I felt like I couldn't find God. And in this society we live in today because they have not found God. Just like Job, the problem with their life is pride. Pride became Job's spiritual problem. And Elihu, the fourth friend, you know the Bible starts out in the book of Job that three of his friends came to comfort him. Whoa, I tell you what, if you're like Job's friends and I'm hurting, don't come comfort me. I just soon be alone with God. They were rough friends. I tell you what, they condemned him. And Elijah said the problem is they couldn't even find a reason to condemn him. Yeah. People are condemning and they don't even need a reason today. Yeah. But Elijah enters and confronts Job with the fact that he is a righteous man, but he's too focused on his righteousness and he overlooks his pride. So Elijah sets forth an argument to defend the justice of God. Can I tell you this morning, I'm going to do a little defending today. I'm going to defend. I cannot stand in place. God don't need a lawyer. He don't need an attorney. God is very capable of taking care of himself. 
But because I represent him upon this earth, I'm going to stand as his attorney. And I'm going to represent him today. And I'm going to defend his character. I'm going to defend his sovereignty. And I'm going to defend his grace this morning. You ready to go with me today in defense of God? I'm standing on the Lord's side. They can do whatever they want to in the midst of this pandemic. They can do whatever they want in the middle of this election. But it's for me and my house. We're going to serve the Lord. I'm going with God. Because he'll be on my side. When you leave me sitting on the corner, God, we'll go with you all the way, even to the end of the world. I'm going to defend God's character. God is a good God. Why is he good? Because God is greater than man. I said God is greater than man. When you find somebody that says, I understand the Bible, I can tell you anything, I can give you any answer, I can explain God, then you know he's a false teacher or he's serving a false God. Because if you can explain God, my friend, then he ain't big enough to be God. Whoa! God's greater than man. The Bible tells us in the book of Numbers 23, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he, not, shall he not do it? And hath he spoken it? And shall he not make it good? Hallelujah to God today. Laura made an excellent point the other day that uh, words have a powerful influence in people's life. Amen. I've tried to learn, and I'm still learning. I'm, the older I get, the less judgmental I get. Some folks, the older they get, the more contrary and the more judgmental they get. But the older I get, the less judgmental that I am. Because you see, it's hard for me to judge a man because I'm not in his place. It's hard for me to judge a man because I've not been where he's been. It's hard for me to judge a man because he may not have the same understanding that I have. It's hard for me to judge another person because God may not have revealed to them what he's revealed to me. So be careful about your judgment about other people. But the writer said, God's not a man. And he has he not spoken and really not make it good. Words have a powerful influence in our life. We have to be careful. I try to be encouraging to people. And speak encouragement to them. You can do it. You're going to make it. God's doing something in your life. Hang in there. Don't give up. If they can do it, you can do it. God is working for you. We need to be encouraging to one another. Words are a powerful thing. In the very first chapter of the book of Genesis, the Bible tells us about the creation. And the Bible said that when God created the heavens and the earth and he created the birds of the sea and he created the first day, what did he do? He spoke and he said, it is good. It is good. It was the word of God that spoke to that creation. And everything that he spoke, it was good. And I believe he's speaking into people's lives today. You notice the Bible said that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form. Verse number 2, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Hebrew illusion there is that the word, and when God created it, it became empty and void. I'm not going to preach to you what happened because I don't know what happened there. But Apparently the earth became void. It became empty. It became dark. But God said, let there be light. And there was light. Can I tell you today? A lot of people's lives are void. And they're empty today. But God is speaking a word today. And he's speaking light into people's lives today. Woo! Pardon me if I get a little beside myself. It may not feel out there what it's feeling like up here. But I tell you what, there's a furnace underneath my feet this morning. God is greater than man. That's why I want God in charge of my life. That's why I want God in, in control of everything that I do. Because God is greater than man. But not only is God greater than man, God is love. Now all this new age group are to say, hallelujah. Because that's the only way they see God. It's just a little some powder puff God just going around loving everybody. No matter how you live, what you do, curse his name, use it in vain, he just loves everybody. He's too weak to do anything about it. But when I talk about love, you can ask Tyler, love's tough. Love's tough. Remember that time we was coming home, you and Lexi was fighting in the back seat, and they fought the whole time. Don't want to embarrass him here, but he'll tell you. <laughs> 
We sat around the dinner table one time, they said, come on over, and I told him, I said, son, I brought you into this world. He said, I know, Dad, you take me out. <laughs> I said, if you all don't stop, I'm going to wear you both out. Quiet down a little bit, and then you hear this little, now they get that last word in. Let's say something, Tyler, say something. Let's say, I said, one more word. We was within a mile of the house down at DJ's. One more word. And Tyler had to get her in. <laughs> I don't know what we... He was Lexi. Was it Lexi? He was Lexi. <laughs> yeah, Lexi. Lexi was the one a little more brassy. Tyler was like, hey. So, so we were doing probably 50 mile there. I bowled that, I bowled that thing up and slid off the side of the road. It looked like something off Starsky and Hutch. <laughs> Dust flying, rocks flying, cars going by us thinking that we're wrecking. I jump out of there, slide my belt on, drag her out of there. Pretty sure I was first. <laughs> <laughs> you know love's tough. Love's not squishy, it's not childish, love's tough. As somebody that's married, if they're in love with each other, they got to put up some garbage, got to put up with some tough stuff. But love is tough today. Love is tough. When I told them kids, don't get out there in that road, don't play with that electrical outlet. But when they would get a hold of it, I had to yank them back and tan their little hiney because I didn't want them to get killed. I didn't want them to get hurt. God loves humanity. God is a God of love today. Notice what John said in his first epistle. He that don't know, that don't love, don't know God. Because God is love. You want to make your relationship better, put God in it. If you don't know how to love your partner, if, if you don't love God first. Isaiah said it like this, For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but the kindness of the Lord shall not depart. Neither shall the covenant of his peace be removed, for the Lord will have mercy on you. God is a God of love. We sung it a while ago, God is holy. We forgot that characteristic of God in this last day. We think God just wants everybody to come to church. We think uh, God just wants everybody to come put a buck in the plate. But God said in Leviticus, I'm the Lord that brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore be holy because I'm holy. He said, I brought you out of Egypt not just to save you from death, not just to get you out of bondage, but I brought you out to be your God. God don't just save you from hell. He don't just save you to put your name on a church ledger. He saves you that he can be your God and he can have a relationship with you today. God is incapable of evil. James said, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God because God don't tempt any man with evil. Whenever a man is tempted, he's tempted when he's driven away by his own lust. And when lust is enticed and conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. And then we said, the Lord is good. The prophet Nahum said, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows them that trust in him. Thank God for that. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? It's kind of like that cartoon strip that I seen not too, uh, several years ago, Dennis the Menace and him and his little friend was leaving Mrs. Wilson's house with a bunch of cookies she gave him. And Joey looks at Dennis and he says, You know, Dennis, I wonder what we did to deserve these cookies. And Dennis said, Look, Joey, Miss Wills just gives us these cookies not because we're nice, but because she is. What you got today is not because you're good. What you have of God today is because He's good. Amen. Amen. A lot of people living today like they earn the goodness of God. You can't earn His goodness. God is good. So that's defense of God's goodness. But to defend His sovereignty, God reigns over creation. I don't know what these political figures think that they're doing and they play around with the laws and all these executive orders and trying to force people to do things that are unconstitutional in this country, other countries living under dictatorship. I don't know who they think that they are, but God is ultimately in control. They don't move a finger without God allowing them to pass the pen. I'm telling you today, God is in control of our world. 
He's in control of history. He is an ultimate control over the course of this world. He's the king. The psalmist said in Psalms 103, the Lord prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. Sovereignty is like, uh, in our perspective, we can understand that sovereignty is like a football field. And you and I live in that football field, and evil lives in that football field. But you and I are bound by the limits of that football field, and so is evil. Evil can't do what it can only function in the world that God has bound it up in. Can I tell you today that Satan is limited by God, but one of these days he's going to meet his final end. He's going to burn forever. Hallelujah to God today. The Bible tells us in Revelation, he knows that his time is short. We read in the book of Daniel, you'll read these words, time, times, and time a half. That illustrates the limits of God that he's put upon evil. There's going to be a day that it's going to end. God has entrusted us to this world. We not only need to accept our freedom, everybody wants their freedom. They want to, uh, they want to speed without getting a speeding ticket. I figured I'd give Richard his due I've slowed down a lot Richard and uh, I've not got a ticket in a long time not because they ain't caught me but I've, I've really slowed down I, I try to maintain the speed limit most of the time Laura but not only do we need to accept our freedom we need to accept our responsibilities and our accountability Everybody wants the freedom of God, but they don't want to be accountable to Him. Everybody wants the freedom of God, but they don't want to be responsible to Him. But to accept freedom from God, if you want God to set you free, then you've got to accept the accountability and responsibility that God sets you free. Amen. You remember the story when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated? Horrible day in history. The nation went into mourning, and there was confusion and despair and agony going on in New York City. A crowd had got together to express their sorrow for this great leader and their concerns about the future. And it was totally chaos until a man, a man climbed up on a ladder when he could get above the crowd and he shouted three times, The Lord reigns over Washington. And I tell you, we can stand up and shout that today. The Lord reigns over Washington. The Lord reigns over Washington. I believe he's still in control today. And I'm glad that I'm one of his. God is a sovereign God. And he's in control of this whole world today. Amen. And then in defense of God's grace. How do you defend God's grace? Well, I go all the way back to the beginning of creation. The Bible said that he created man. And then from man, out of his side, he pulled a woman. And out of that man and woman, he pulled a family. And out of that family, he pulled a society. But when Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't destroy the world. He could have. But he extended his grace. Hallelujah. Even, even before physical Calvary. Even before physical Calvary. Calvary. Now, why do you say it like that? Well, if you're having a theo theological conquest, you ask me after church, we'll get into a theological discussion about it. But when Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't destroy the world. But he gave them grace to handle it. He gave them grace to handle it so that he could continue the human story. And that's why we're here today. We're here today because of the grace of God. We're here today because of the grace of God. The world may say, well, how can God be grace and how can God be love with all the things that is going on in this world, such as the story, such as the story of our life as the world turns. We live in an imperfect world. And God desires to deliver and to bless those that will seek his face. I believe we can come out of any dilemma by the grace of God. You hear me this morning? Yes. You hear me on Facebook and on YouTube? You can come out of any dilemma. If you're listening down at the crack house, if you're listening down at the rehab house, I can tell you, you can come out of any dilemma because you don't have to depend upon a man. There's a God that wants to deliver you. He's full of grace and he's full of mercy today. John said in his first epistle, we beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. And truth. 
Glory to God. We can come out of any dilemma. We can turn any situation around by the grace of God. You can't do it in yourself, and that's the problem. We get depressed when we try and fail, try and fail, try and fail, until one day we open our eyes and say, God, if you don't help me, I can't make it. As soon as we recognize that, he said, as soon as you look for me with a whole heart, that's when you'll find me. Paul said, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. My Lord, thank God. He's had to abound a lot of grace toward me. He's able to make all grace abound toward you. That you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. You see, God saves us. God delivers us. He sends us His grace. A lot of folks uh, think that means that just gets me out of hell and I can do whatever I want to now. I feel better about myself. But he said, God is able with all sufficiency to make all grace abound to you for every good work. God didn't save you to sit on a pew. He didn't save you just to sit in a church. He didn't save you just to keep you out of hell. He saved you that he might abound grace unto you that you can do the good works of God. Help this world that needs to see the Lord. They need to know that God is a God of grace today. Three life lessons. We need to trust God's character. We need to worship God's majesty. And we need to depend upon God's grace. You can't live good enough to get to heaven, folks. I don't care how long you've been saved. We're as dependent as a crack addict on the Lord to help us. Your problem may just be different than theirs. Back in 1871, there was a great fire in Chicago. Most of you historians may know this. Over 300 people died. And another 100,000 was left homeless. One of the heroes of the great Chicago fire was an attorney named Horatio Spafford. In that fire, this great man lost a lot of real estate. Just the year before, he lost his young son who had died, but he helped others that were homeless because of the fire. Because of his generosity and his service to serve his community, he became well known throughout all of Chicago as a real Christian, a true Christian. A lot of people, if you watch their live, the only way you know there's Christian if they popped into church once in a while, and you might think they were. But if you saw them in their everyday life, you'd have no idea. Because they, they serve the Lord only in name, but they don't live for him. But in November 1873, just a couple years after this, he's already lost a son, lost many friends, lost a whole lot of property. Spafford and his family decided to take a vacation. He was a good friend of D.L. Moody, and most of you that have any historical church behind you, you know D.L. Moody. And they decided to meet Moody with his family on one of his evangelistic campaigns in England. And there from England, him and his family would travel to Europe. But before they could leave, Horatio was unexpectedly detained by business concerns there in Chicago. But his wife, Anna, and their daughters went ahead on to England where they would wait for him. But just off Newfoundland, the ship collided with an English sailing vessel and sunk within 20 minutes. His wife, Anna, was the one of the only eight, 81 passengers that survived. Tragically, all four of his daughters died along with 226 others. Anna Spafford's heartbreaking telegram to her husband simply read, saved alone. He immediately set sail for England to join her, to comfort her, and as the ship that he was traveling on passed by the location where his daughters drowned, Horatio Spafford sat down and wrote these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Some of these old songs, folks, they ain't like songs today. People write songs today to make a hit. They write songs today to make a gold record. They make songs today to 
plead for your attention that they can get your money and get high on the charts. Some of our old Christian songs were written out of the tragedy of people's lives and they mean something. Hallelujah to God. What are you saying today? I'm in defense of God today and I'm going to be like old Job was. Job said, I've done everything that I know to live right and I've tried to live right before God. And you'll read on in the 38, 39, 40, 41, and 42nd chapters of Job. Job has a conversation with the Lord and Job, the Bible said, then the Lord responded to Job and he said, Job, Get up, stand up and gird up your loins like a man. You questioned me and now I'm going to answer you. Where were you at when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you at when the stars began to fall from heaven? Where were you at? Can you meet out the heavens with the span of your hand when play at ease? Can you today tell me the measurements of the earth? Can you tell me where the snow and the rain hide themselves? Can you tell me how to formulate a piece of hell? Joe, where were you at? I'm God and God alone and besides me there is no other God I'm telling you I'm going with God today I'm going to stand for the Lord today God is on trial but I'm putting myself on his side today I may not be able to help you but I know a God that can when people come to me for help and assistance I don't point them to the church and I love our church and I don't point them to a denomination. And there may be some good ones out there. I don't point them to lawyers. I don't know if there's any good ones out there. <laughs> but I point them to the Lord. Amen. So many of our problems would come clear if we just give it to the Lord. Amen. That don't mean your life's perfect. That don't mean life is easy. That don't mean life, that don't mean tomorrow you're going to get up and the work that's on your nose is going to be gone. But it means he can give you a revelation. He can turn your life around like that. Amen. Will you stand with us all over the house this morning? They get us some music and prepare us a song.